And welcome to Lickwake, San Francisco's literary festival. I'm Jack Bulwer from Lickwake, and we are streaming live to you right now from the San Francisco Bay Area and around the world. This is our 21st festival this year, and it's all virtual, so it's an experiment in terror, but I'm sure we will get through it. Our schedule runs through October 24th. You can catch all the details for future events at lickquake.org. Today we are, or tonight, depending on where you are, we are honored to be able to present Fernanda Melchor, celebrating release of her debut novel, Hurricane Season, published this year in English, and she will be in conversation with author Yuri Herrera. A few things before we uh, start the event, please feel free to ask Fernanda and Yuri questions using the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen and we'll um, address your questions in the second half of the event. Afterwards, you'll be asked to fill out a quick survey. Uh, we ask you to take a couple of minutes and uh, answer a few basic questions. We just wanna know more about you, who you are, how we can provide better programming for you, and uh, how we can fundraise and continue to afford to do things like this. Um, don't forget to follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram for the latest updates for the festival. And you can support both of our authors tonight by buying their books. Please buy their books. They both had books this year and there was no book tour. So please buy their books. You can either go to your favorite independent bookstore or you can go to our Liquid online store at bookshop.org. We also ask for your support of the Liquid organization tonight to allow us to continue to bring these events largely for free. I think the entire festival this year was free, is free, except for two events. So even Netflix costs money, but literary events are free. So if you believe in keeping literature a key component of the cultural landscape here in San Francisco, please consider dropping us a few dollars. Every bit does help. We can accept donations at Venmo at Liquid, on PayPal at info at liquid.org, or directly at our website at liquid.org. Board. So let's get on the show. This is going to be great. Tonight we celebrate the publication of Fernanda's novel Hurricane Season. One of Mexico's most promising and prominent writers, Fernanda Melcher has created in her debut novel Hurricane Season, a Gulf Coast noir drawing comparisons to everyone from Faulkner to Bolaño and Marlon James. Beginning with the discovery of a corpse by a group of children playing near the irrigation canals, a Mexican village is propelled into an investigation of how and why the murder occurred. The critical reaction for this book is really amazing and would be env enviable for any author. NPR has called a hurricane season, quote, a mix of drugs, sex, mythology, small town desperation, poverty, and superstition. The Los Angeles Review of Books describes it as, quote, a novel that sinks like lead to the bottom of the soul and remains there. Its images full of color, its characters alive and raging against their fate. Speaking with Fernando this evening is author Yuri Herrera. Born in Octopon, Mexico, Yuri is a political scientist, editor, and an award-winning author of several books in both Spanish and English, including Kingdom Cons, Signs Preceding the End of the World, The Transmigration of Bodies, and earlier this year, A Silent Fury, The El Bordo Mine Fire. He teaches in the Spanish Portuguese department at Tulane University, and he is speaking to us live from his home in New Orleans. Now for our, uh, our special guest tonight, Fernando Melcher was born in Veracruz, Mexico. She's widely recognized as one of the most exciting new voices of Mexican literature. Her novel, Hurricane Season, translated by Sophie Hughes, and her uh, new collection, This Is Not Miami, are both published this year from New Directions. She is speaking to us live from Puebla, Mexico, just outside Mexico City. Please give a huge welcome it virtually to Fernanda and Yuri. Thank you, Jack. Uh, thank you, everybody, uh, for being online tonight. This is the best thing to do on a Friday night during the, during the pandemic. <laughs> Maybe in any Friday night, but in this one, this one especially, I'm really happy to be again with my dear friend Fernanda. 
And um, well, uh, Fernanda, uh, Jack already talked about your novel. He mentioned several several comments about your novel. But I, I would like to get started for the people that have not read it and that uh, are interested in, in, in getting the book. In your own words, how would you describe uh, Hurricane Sister? Hi. Hi, everyone. Uh, hi, Yuri. It's always a pleasure talking to you. And of course, I'm, I'm really, really happy to be at Leadquake. And, and I wish I, I, I could be at uh, San Francisco, but now it is not possible. So I welcome you into my living room. <laughs> and uh, it, it is really a pleasure to be here and have this opportunity to talk uh, about hurricane season. As Jack said, uh, uh, the, the authors that uh, published book this year with we never got the chance to do a book tour. Uh, I was, um, I planned to go to the States and tour intensively, but I don't know, coronavirus uh, had a different plans for all of us. So, but it's, it's great to be here. And, and of course, I, I would love to talk about hurricane season. And uh, for me, it, it wasn't, it, it is a novel that it really uh, took a lot of me by writing it because for me, it was very important to write an obscure novel that talk about the things that worried me at that time uh, about Mexico, of course, and, and the situation of uh, uh, women's right, uh, and, and also the violence that we experience in the, uh, I think the hate of the uh, drug trafficking war uh, in Mexico. So, at the same time, it was this uh, like social worries, but at the same time, I was going through a, like a really bad time emotionally in in my personal life, and I was questioning a lot of um, things that were going in my, in my life, and one of them was uh, motherhood. I was raising my stepdaughter. Uh, I, I raised her from six years old to twelve years old, and. Uh, mothering was really something that uh, was amazing and at the same time was really scary because it, it awaked like a lot of feelings that I never thought I was capable of and that uh, amazing experience that was motherhood uh, like launched me to write this book and the, the, the plot is very simple in fact it is impossible to make spoilers of this well not impossible but it's very difficult to make spoilers of this novel because uh, it begins with a uh, with a dead body with a uh, with a corpse of uh, of um, the, the the local witch the, the the witch of this small town you know this lost small town uh, just uh, by a by a road uh, in Mexico in the southeast of Mexico and it turns into uh, I think an exploration of the the motives uh, for crime in the human heart. And I just wanted to write a novel where you can, where, where I could show that how easy it was to kill a woman or to kill any people or to kill any person in Mexico and how it was, uh, how it had no consequences. And the novel is basically like the secret story of a murder. Uh, normally when we uh, read the newspaper, we end up um, figuring out the facts we uh, we know like the names and the the events and and uh, the objectivity of what took place for that murder to to take place. And in hurricane season, what I wanted to work was with the the other side of the crime. That's the subjectivity of the people involved and all all kinds of people. Not not only the victimaries, the the, the murderers, but also the community and how uh, things like this can took place, check, can take place in a, in a very small, like closed and, and full of prejudice community. Like every, every community is, is kind of a closed and full of prejudice um, uh, normally. But this was like the extreme, you know, I, I wanted to take this story to the, to the extreme. And I, well, you know, the, the novel is also told like, uh, in the third person uh, by uh, different narrators, all unreliable, and each one of them, but, but not like, like, um, like, like this novel by Faulkner, I totally forgot the name, While I Lay Dying. It is not a monologue. 
it's like something different. It's, it's a different kind of narrator that's inside the mind of each character and tells like the version of each character until we got to that heart of the crime. And, and that's basically what I, what I wanted to do. Well, I wanted to ask you about that. Uh, that has to do with the last thing you said about the narrative voice, you know, because the novel in itself is a great plot, but the plot can be built in different ways. And this is a plot that really um, uh, gains volume and, and really comes, comes uh, to, to become a novel thanks to your work on the narrative voice. How, how do you work that? Uh, how do you inhabit those voices? How do you um, do, how do you distinguish one from, from, from the other one? Uh, I'm really interested in, 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 in different parts of your process. I'm gonna ask more about your process, but I wanted to start with that since you already mentioned that. I, I normally um, will be critical with the writers that uh, said that they hear voices inside their heads because it's kind of, um, I don't know, it doesn't exactly describe the situation when you are writing fiction, but uh, for this particular novel, I used to hear a lot of voices from the community, of the imaginary community of La Matosa. When I began creating the scenery, when I began uh, thinking how I could turn, uh, uh, how, how, how I could um, like phenomenalize, like, like put into imaginary flesh the, the, this, this story. I, was be, I began by creating this small town and the, you know, like the, these horrible bars and cantinas at the side of the road and, and strip clubs and, and all these uh, kind of um, um, like vulgar ambience of the truck stops, like, you know, like, like um, this side of the side of the road. And Did you actually make a, made a map, an actual map I, with, with the town? I do have a map of the town because it's a, in fact, uh, things happen in La Matosa, but in fact, there's another small town called Villa Garbosa by the side, and there's a river, and that, there's the road, of course, that's, that's the scenery by, by itself, mm -hmm. and there's near, near, nearby towns. And so I have a small map that I had to sketch. To, to place the murder exactly where where are the the cane fields for example where where the murder uh, takes place and where the body was dumped and, and yeah I I sometimes need to do that uh, to sketch things and I do a lot of um, schemes also to to I don't know just to get the right order because I, I was telling you I was hearing these voices of of, of the women of La Matosa. Uh, they were prostitutes or there were like housewives or there were like um, um, uh, people who inhabit that place or, or they work in the fields and they were talking about who was the murderer and who was the witch, the, the person who was, who was murdered. And they were talking and, uh, you know, contradicting each other, like gossiping all around. So I kind of took the, the, the liberty to write all what these women were saying and in my mind, of course, and, and and then like these characters started to emerge, like more strongly related to the to the crime, and it was a process that began like that, like these um, uh, like faraway voices that I couldn't identify, and then with um, with abstraction, with uh, literary techniques, I start building characters, and and. The, doing these things like like sketching or like um, trying to figure it out what happened first or what gets to be told first because that that is the thing that was a, a challenge for me I, I already knew what was going to happen and you know the end is at the beginning the witch is dead and we get to know who killed who killed her and uh, most of all why and how and, and all these important questions that normally don't get answered in, by journalism, for example, but they do get answered by fiction. So I, I don't know, for me, you know, I think I uh, have like this dissociation when I write. I, it's really hard for me to remember how I, I, I wrote this novel 
because I think I was always like in a haze and totally concentrated in this. So I spent like five weeks like out of space just thinking about it. And for me, it's really difficult to think how it was done. I have to reconstruct the, the process by sometimes uh, like, you know, I in my own uh, sketches or my workbooks or different versions, but I, I wrote like crazy. Uh, I wrote, I think I wrote like three or four times uh, more pages that the book is like four or 500 pages that, I, that end up in the, in the trash can because it was only the preparation for writing this novel. So I, I, what I wanted to do really was to put each word in the place that it was meant. And it is so weird to read it now in English because it's, I, I always feel like the words are scattered in the wrong way, but in English it makes sense, you know? Well, there's there's a lot of things that I want to that I want to ask. I want to ask you about that, about about how you feel about the, the English version of of your book, about the translation process. But before that, I I want to ask one more thing about the the process. That you already said that you you can't remember the whole thing, but this is very important because now that I was rereading rereading it, I was just amazed of how organic it feels, how natural it feels, and for me that is the mark of a really good book when you just feel that it just was a book that uh, that wrote itself uh, well uh, the book wrote itself you know but of course as you just said there's a lot of a lot of work behind that there's a lot of work uh, behind something that feels natural and that feels easy and i just wanted to 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 ask this thing about the structure how much of the structure do you have ready before you write and how much of it do, do you discover as you are writing it how much do you uh, go back and redo it how much do you reorganize the whole thing as you're writing i i'm much of a discoverer i guess i uh, normally when i start writing I, I never know what's going to how how it's going to be like in terms of form and, and a structure. Normally when I start writing, I know it, that won't be like the final version. It's going to be like, maybe I'll start in the middle or, or I'll start by something that uh, for me, it seems easier or, or, or that needs less work. And, and I just try to find a voice like intuitively. And then uh, I will like take that and think, what will work and, and how can I get it better? So I, I kind of always, I'm starting and I'm beginning again and starting and beginning again and, and, and stopping and then going back. And it, it's kind of a tortuous process, but I don't know, at least with hurricane season, that's what it, it was. And um, I think, I, I think I, I'm really glad that you that you say that it feels really organic because it has lots of work behind it. But at the same time, I think I, I work really hard trying not to um, betray the first instinctual natural sound of the novel because uh, that's really how I wanted it to 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 sound. I really want, wanted a prose that was uh, melodical, rhythm, full of rhythm, but also like, you know, harsh with, with really the language of the streets, like really how people talk in small uh, towns, like, uh, like the things you say to yourself without any censorship, without uh, anybody uh, listening, because that's what happened, that each character has uh, uh, kind of, um, kind of uh, talks from, the, from their hearts without any censorship at all. So they can think and say things that they will normally accept. And I, I, like, I, I, I wanted to play with that, to, to make them talk and, and then to make them think things that they will never say and they, that contradict the things that they are, are talking. And it, it is a really a homage uh, from the, it's a really a homage for uh, for the really I think beautiful and really rhythmic way uh, of uh, people from Veracruz, uh, the way they talk, the the oral expression and the oral traditions of Veracruz, 
in Veracruz, uh, we, we participate of this. Um, I think you are right now in New Orleans, and I think Veracruz has a lot of, um, um, of um, uh, connecting lines with New Orleans, and also with uh, Cuba and Puerto Rico and the Caribbean. And Veracruz is not precisely uh, located in the Caribbean, it's in the Gulf of Mexico, but it, but it participates of certain culture. And this culture uh, really gives a lot of importance to talking, to telling stories orally. Uh, in Veracruz, it's not really a source of uh, recognition to be a writer. It's more important to be a, pe a person that can tell jokes, for example, mm. that can tell a story while you know drinking a little bit, and and who can improvise rhymes. The, the la decima, uh, it's a tradition of improv improvised poetry, and and now with the younger gener generations is improvising reggaeton, for example. So I kind of I kind of wanted the book to have that feeling, you know, that 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 rapping uh, reggaeton esque. Uh, uh, rhythm and 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 spicy like like uh, people talking the way people talk in Veracruz. Well, it totally has that, and also it it has like a really complex mixture of emotions. I was just thinking today that it uh, that this way in which that the Germans have these words that describe uh, like really complex emotions, like that you are happy that someone else is having a bad time, and I was trying to describe the mood behind these narrative voices, the attitude behind these narrative voices. And I was thinking, uh, I was just coming up with this, uh, this sort of Mexican word, uh, like cabuli en cabronamiento, which has the, obviously no, no translation, but would be something like jokey, jo jokey pissed off, or something <laughs> like that. And um, because it, it's, it's not just a, a flat mood towards the, the book, but it's something that is changing depending on, on what you're saying. But also one thing that I was thinking related to this is that you were saying when you start writing, you are not sure where you are in what direction you are going. But at the same time, you know certain things that you want there to be. Like in this case, you wanted to the novel to sound in a certain way and you not you wanted the novel to do to 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 be a homage to, to a certain way of talking or jo of joking or of reflecting on reality. And I wanted to ask you in regards to the ethical stance in this novel, because this is a novel in which the, the narrative voice also is an ethical voice that is all the time somehow having a, a, a certain ethical attitude towards horror, towards violence. There is, um, there is, uh, even though this is a novel with a lot of violence, of so different kinds of violence, it's a novel in which there is a lot of respect towards, towards the story you're telling, towards the, the, the people in this story. And, and also, I think that there is something about the collective responsibility towards violence, you know? Can you talk a little bit, a, a little bit about that? If this is one of the things that you had clear at the beginning, a certain ethical attitude towards the, the, what you were going to tell. Uh, I will never say that I, I, I will never say that I'm a moral writer, for example. But I do have my own moral standards, of course, as, as anybody. And of course, I think that permits to to that that leaks into the into the into the work. And I tried really hard to expose things that I find uh, terrible, like, okay, homophobia, misogyny, um, like uh, child abuse, for example, or sexual abuse, or a lot of attitudes that are really normalized in, in Mexico and, in, and or societies in general, not, not only Mexico, of course. And I work really hard just to like make it visible, but at the same time mm, showing that it's wrong or showing the contradictions that the, that the perpetrators uh, uh, have in it, in, inside themselves. So, for example, uh, I think the character of Brando, uh, Brando, uh, who's really homophobic, he talks 
uh, horribly about gay people, but at the same time he feels this really strong desire for a, for a friend of his, for Liz me. And in his discourse, you can tell the homophobia, and then in his thinking, you get to feel what he really feels about. And that is a really a struggle for him, a really horrible struggle, because I cannot think for anything most painful for a, for a human being than to be in uh, opposition with their true desires. And for Brando, this is the struggle, and that's the hate he feels all the time, and the rage, and also the sadness. There's a really, really, really uh, heavy sadness in, in, Brando, in Brando's story because of that. So for me, it was really difficult to do that. Uh, for example, the story of Norma, who, who, who uh, gives herself to her stepfather uh, because she is so hunger of love that uh, she mistakes uh, sexuality for tenderness. She, she wants to talk in the language of tenderness, but she gets answer in the language of passion, which she's not ready because she's 13 years old. And that ends up really bad. And I just wanted to show the, that, that side of, of victims of uh, child abuse, sexual abuse, uh, how, how complex it can be and how all these feelings of um, not only pain and rage and, and anger, but also sadness and also guilt. You can, you, of course, you can be the victim and feel super guilty. And, and also this, is, this, this tiny spark of desire of, of, a, small, of a young girl uh, uh, in search of her sexuality, of what gives her pleasure. So I wanted to work always in this place, in, in, the, in, in the space of ambiguity, always in, in the ambivalence that every human being we, we, we feel. And it is really hard, you know, because it, um, it, it implies that to, to get in touch with parts of yourself as a writer that sometimes you're not ready to, to talk about. But at the same time, I, I really wanted to do that. I just, I know some people think that hurricane season is poverty porn, for example, but I tried really hard for it not to be. I really wanted to humanize and show a human face of uh, how horrible things happen. And we're still humans. Humans, we are capable of horrible things too. I think it is written with a lot of respect and uh, with what you just said, with a lot of nuance, with a lot of layers. And I wanted to ask something that is related to that. Oh, by the way, uh, we already have some questions from the audience, but before that, I just want to ask two or three more questions and to hear you read an excerpt from the book. But one of the questions that I wanted to ask what has, has to do with this, with the ambiguity that is there, with the layers, with the nuances. And, and this is, I would say, the biggest challenge in, in a translation. Uh, translations are, are, are something that is wonderful and also it's the acceptance of a loss because the translations uh, are a process by which your book is going to sound completely different. Now that you were talking about how sound was important, it will, it will sound completely different. It will sound maybe as beautiful or beautiful in a different way, but also when you translate, all the, those nuances have to be worked. All those nuances can be lost or can turn into different kind of, a different kind of ambiguity. What is your, your relation with the many, many translations? How many translations is like 26 translations? Right now, yes, but of course I haven't been able to read uh, just the English one and the French one because that's the only languages I, I can really read. Tell us about it. Well, um, to be totally honest, I never thought this novel will get so much interest by the public, uh, by the readers, and less from readers from other cultures and, and countries. For me, it was a total surprise. I just, uh, I just needed to write it. So when I finished and it was published, I was pretty much content with it. <laughs> And um, then it began to be read a lot in Mexico uh, by, uh, that, that, that always amazed me, by 
people that are normally younger than me, my generation or, or younger, like, like um, readers born in the 80s and the 90s. And I, I think that is so cool. And then it, it began to get translated. And I, I don't know, I just never thought it was possible to translate a book like this. But at the same time, I'm a translator myself. I translate novels from uh, English to Spanish. And um, I know it's possible to translate everything. It, it is that sometimes you lose something in the process, but you make sacrifices. You, you, you choose uh, in, in, in favor of uh, comprehension. You sometimes uh, accept that you have to lose a little bit of something and, and you play with that. It, it's like a creative form of writing for me, translation. So I was really happy when Sophie Hughes, that's a translator that I really, really respect, uh, that, that she accepted to, to translate Hurricane Season. And I knew from the beginning, from the questions she asked me for the kind of relationship we developed, uh, she asked me what kind of movies and music I was listening when I wrote uh, Hurricane Season, for example. And I told her uh, that I was a really a, a, a super fan of Harmony Corinne Gumos or, or Larry Clark's uh, Kids, for example, that kind of, a, mm -hmm. you know, crude language, like really, really, really uh, like reality, like. And uh, we, we really, you know, we had a lot of chemistry and I really liked the, the, the translation she, she did because as you were telling us, um, I think the difficult part with a novel like this is to find another kind of music. There is a music in Spanish for this book, and there, there's got, there has to be another music in, in the English version. Not the same one, but it has to be a music, because if there isn't, there, then it is not the same book. And uh, also there's the thing with the slurs and the obscenities and the profanities that uh, she did something that I've that I, that I found amazing, that is, she not only translated the words, but that hidden intention behind the words, that moralizing ethical intention behind the words. And for me, that was a huge relief because I was so scared to be, I don't know, like, uh, you know, like considered a racist or, or homophobic mm. because of what I'm saying in the novel, but in fact, it's only presenting these, these materials. And, 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 not, and it is not me talking or, 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 or having that opinion about uh, gay people or trans people or, or women, but it is the characters. And for me, it was a, 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 an achievement that she managed to, to, to include that side B of the, of the words in, in the book. Great. And, and the other translation, I, I really, I cannot do anything. I think this year we signed it for Lithuanian and hmm. Korean. So with that, you just, you know, you, yeah. you personate you just, yourself and exactly, you cross yourself and you say, well, let it be whatever it has to be. The book is, is, is having a life of its own and that, that's great, no? That it's just existing in, in places that you didn't suspect. And hey, and um, before you having you read an excerpt and reading some questions from from the audience, I wanted uh, one last question. Um, how do you see yourself within the the the, the last uh, or the most recent wave of writers in Mexico? Um, there's a, a lot of, of very good writers. Uh, there, uh, there's, uh, there's you, Valeria Luiselli, Brenda Navarro, Jorge Comenzal. There, there's a lot of people writing um, very different things. Do you see something in common, or is it something? Is it not useful anymore to talk about generations, mm -hmm. to talk about movements? Um, oh, is there something? Uh, uh, about the space from where you're working, about the, the, the topics? What, what can you say about this? I, I think um, it is amazing to be part of this new generation of writers. And, and I'm more amazed to think that there are already uh, writers born in the 90s that are already publishing. And that's, mm -hmm. I think it's great. And, and um, I, I think writers born in the 80s are, even less, we feel less 
uh, as a generation than the, the writers born in the 70s. Because, you know, uh, the writers born in the 70s, uh, it's kind of a cliche to say it, but in, in Mexican literature, but it is supposed that writers born in the 70s uh, just uh, um, like great with this stereotype of the writer that the boom literature um, uh, proposed. And uh, they normally don't feel part of a generation because their themes are, their, their uh, thematics and, and uh, worries and preoccupations as artists are of a very diverse kind. And I think with the 80s, the same thing happens. I, I love what Jorge Comensal is doing, for example, but I don't really feel related to what he's doing, even though I admire him as Brenda and as Valeria, of course, and, and lots of uh, young writers. And I kind of feel closer, uh, more, for example, to gender or, or to age, but to a certain um, kind of writers that, that write from the right outside uh, Mexico City. Because in Mexico, we have like this, uh, the canon was built in, in Mexico City from the center of the country. It was centralized. And uh, I come from a generation that didn't have to pass through Mexico City to make a career in literature. So I think it's important. And things like, you know, like social networking and these virtual um, uh, new ways of communicating that helps us a lot to get to, to, get to be known before, uh, having to live in Mexico City and, you know, going to parties with the editors and publishers and, you know, uh, the, the old kind of way of becoming a writer in Mexico. So I, it, it's also something that um, put us afar from, from writers that write from the center, that writers who, who have this uh, ambition of writing like the grand Latin American novel, for example, that was the ambition of the writers of the boom, like Vargas Llosa, mm -hmm. like Gabriel Garcia Marquez, like Jose Donoso. And, and, and I think we are more interested in certain regions and in micro history and not in, um, you know, telling the big tales of modernity as, as writers from past generations uh, and did or, or intended to do. So I just, re, I, I'm writing fro, from the southeast of Mexico and about the southeast of Mexico. And it is a really a landscape that didn't have much representation in Mexican literature. Uh, I mean, uh, outside Vera, putting Veracruz as a, you know, like this tropical place where everybody goes to, you know, in, in holidays and, and uh, to, to uh, different kind of like a dramatic place where 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 um, where you can describe the existence of uh, people uh, who have this particular experience of life in, in, in this area. Hey Fernanda, would you read uh, an excerpt from the novel before we get to uh, some of the questions that the audience is sending us? I would gladly read a, an, a little excerpt. I, I thought it was five minutes, but it is not five minutes. It's way less. Okay. And I really get nervous when I read in English because that happens, it, it happens just like you just said. Uh, the first time I had to read out loud, I found out that all the words were different and of <laughs> course, and it, they had like a different sound and it really took me a lot to get used to it. So I'm gonna read you a little bit about the middle of the novel. And it's a story that Norma, characters Norma, is reading. And it's like a small book inside the book. And I really like it for that. Because one day on her way from school, on her way home from school, Norma found a little paperback book with a ripped cover and fairy tales for children of all ages written across it. And an unopening at random the first thing she saw was a black and white illustration of a little hunchback crying terrified while a coven of witches with bad wings stabbed the hunch on his back. And the illustration was so strange that ignoring the time and the imminent rain, ignoring the dishes waiting to be washed, and her siblings who needed feeding before their mother got home from the factory, 
Norma sat down at the bus stop to read the whole story because at home there was never time to read anything. And even if there were, she wouldn't be able to with her siblings' racket, the blare of the TV and her, her mother's constant yelling, not to mention people, Pepe's fooling around or the piles of homework that awaited her each night after washing the pots, which she herself had used at noon before leaving for school. And so she pulled the hood of her coat over her head and folded her legs under her skirt. And she read the whole story from start to finish, the tale of the two hunchbacks. That's what the fairy tale was called. And it was about a hunchback who lost his way one evening in the woods, close to his home, dark and sinister woods where witches were said to meet to do their evil deeds. And that's what, that was why the little fellow was so frightened to find himself lost there, unable to find his way home, wandering blindly as night fell, until suddenly he spied a fire in the distance. And thinking it might be a campfire, he ran toward it, convinced that he'd been safe. So imagine his surprise when he arrived at the clearing with the gigantic fire, only to realize it was a witch's Sabbath, a coven of horrifying witches with bat, bat wings and claws instead of hands, all dancing around the blazing fire in the most macabre fashion while, while they sang. Monday and Tuesday and Wednesday three. Monday and Tuesday and Wednesday three. Monday and Tuesday and Wednesday three. And they were cackling their terrible witchy cackles and howling up at the full moon. And the hunchback, who was still unseen, had taken cover because behind an enormous rock not, not far from the fire, listened to that cyclic chant and unable to explain how unable to explain the overwhelming urge that came over him, took a deep breath as the witches sang their next, their next Monday and Tuesday and Wednesday three, jump on, jump onto the rock and shouted at the top of his lungs, Thursday and Friday and Saturday six. Amazing. And it, it is great that the English version actually um, recreates the musicality. And I could feel you almost jumping on your seat while you were while you were reading it, because I can feel that you are enjoying this this rewriting, as you were saying, which every translation is a rewriting, no? And uh, I am glad that, that that you think that because this is something that I, I I always say: translators need to be recognized a lot more, need to be paid a lot better. And, okay. and translation is really difficult, and it's an act of creation. It's not a it's not yet simply transcribing, you know. Um, thank you for that, Fernanda. Uh, we have several questions. So I suggest that you, we try to go through all of them, most of them. So let's be executive. David, David Emmanuel says, Fernanda, how, what does it feel like to be thrust into the global literary scene? Also, <laughs> who have you been influenced by? Hi, David, how are you? Um, well, how does it feel? It, it's scary, uh, to tell you the truth. Um, when I first heard that I was going to be translated to English and put in the American market, for example, I was just terrified. I, I, I thought it, I was dreaming and I, I wanted to pinch myself all the time because, you know, it's almost unheard of. I, I'm for a young writer, I mean young for writer standards, a young writer like me uh, from Mexico, like... I don't know. It was. It, it felt. It felt strange. Uh, overall, in a in a country in a culture that doesn't really translate a lot, I think I know it, that's changing. Um, fortunately, but at least in Spanish in Mexico, and I think in Spanish in general, we have a, a language that's really that really welcomes translation. Uh, we we read a lot uh, uh, of translated works, and we are used to read translations, and. Um, now I'm getting used to it and I, for me, it's, it's been amazing, you know, to find um, writers that understand what I try to do and, and, and writing me, you know, like messaging me at Instagram and, and saying how they enjoy the, the, the book and how terrific they thought it was or, or, or how, how impressive uh, uh, and, and shocked they, they end up. Uh, feeling uh, after reading the book and 
you know, that's like a dream come true for a writer, for any writer. And at the same time, I, after the, the Booker Award nomination, it, that was super scary too. Um, I felt like the, the, the eyes of uh, lots of people were on me and that's also like a scary uh, feeling because uh, you, can, you can really, I mean, I, I find it very difficult to write new stuff when I'm thinking how it's going to be received. And now, not only in Mexico, so, you know, I, I, but I'm, I'm always thinking, oh my God, this new novel, is it going to like, in, in, is it going to be, you know, like well received in America or in Europe or in Germany or in, uh, and it gets, uh, I, I don't think that's a good feeling to have while you are thinking in the next book. So I do really strong efforts to forget <laughs> that I'm doing great with this book. And um, Dan Belmont uh, asks, how did the form of the novel happen? We already talked a little bit about it, but if, if you can say something else, uh, did the form develop over time or did you have it clear from the beginning? Um, I, I, had an I had an intuition that it required a lot of voices, but I didn't really want the book to be a collection of witnessing, you know, like a collection of monologues, like as I lay dying, that it's a book for me it's wonderful and I love it but I didn't really want that to be so I, I needed to find like a narrator that was capable of being inside and outside the characters but also I needed to find a form that and, and the name hurricane season came because of that structure because it, it, it is not something that goes from point A to point B but something that spirals to the like a downward spiral like the Nine Inch Nails uh, album that I, which I love and it, it, it's like a downward spiral and to find that uh, it took me a lot of work and, and weeks and months of thinking and at the end I had this intuition uh, I was really worried back at the time it was in two, 2015 uh, 2015 when I was writing this this novel and they were beginning to find a lot of mass graves in my home state, Veracruz. I didn't live in Veracruz back then, but they were finding a lot of mass graves and you know, like, like thousands of several severed members inside those graves. And they were the victims of people who went missing or who, were, who got murdered in, um, and during the war of, uh, against drugs in Mexico. And I just, couldn't stop thinking about mass graves. And then I realized that the novel is a mass grave. That downward spiral, it forms like a mass grave because the first chapter and the last chapter, they are like in the same level of reality. It's a body getting a corpse being found and a corpse being given its last goodbye. And all of that happened inside is like, you know, like, like digging and digging and digging into this horrible uh, grave. And, and the center of the novel is Norma's story, because even in thought, it seems like it has nothing to do with the, with the novel, like it's peripheral. Uh, I, I think it's the heart of the novel because what Norma, Norma's choice is what, um, you know, makes everything happen. It's what ignites the, the whole novel. It, it is amazing to have someone like you, Fernanda, that really can speak so clearly about, about your process because this is not that common. <laughs> So it's a pleasure to really listen to you, and, and I, I'm sure everybody is grateful about that. Um, Tyler Lacey asked, if, did you have any specific writers or books that were references or inspirations for your style in the novel? Um, I think uh, they're mostly Mexicans, uh, Mexican writers. I was uh, really inspired, but in the language, um, with the style, with the harsh colloquial style, I, I was influenced by Jose Agustin, that is a writer from the 60s and the, from the 70s in Mexico that was the first, for example, to include uh, long paragraphs in English because, uh, or to include music from the Rolling Stones, for example, in, 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 the, in the scenes of, of his books. And, and uh, Vicente Leñero also, he has a, a, a book called The Stone Mansions, the, the Los Albañiles. And in this, this book is wonderful because it's a noir novel. It's a, it's, a, it's a crime novel, but at the end you never get to know who killed, uh, um, the, 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 you know, who committed the crime, 
because it tries to mimic like like you know like Mexican justice uh, justice system where sometimes you never get to find who who was the killer but um, it ends up someone ends ends up confessing because you know the policemen beat them so or tortured them and so they confess but it's not like the truth and I wanted to mimic that also and it was a huge for me uh, American writers were a huge uh, inspiration too Faulkner of course with his South Gothic with their Southern Gothic I wanted to do my own Southern Gothic of course and Cormac McCarthy was also like like this uh, amazing inspiration and and a writer uh, like J T Leroy uh, or Laura Albert uh, with their stories about uh, prostitution and 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 you know like communities at the roadsides and and uh, infant abuse and child abuse and sexual abuse and drug use for me it was a huge inspiration and and another w woman writer that inspired me a lot was Agota Christoph mm -hmm. with uh, their trilogy with her trilogy she's amazing you know she's she's one of the most um, uh, crudest writers I ever read and her language is limpid you know it's like crystal clear she doesn't even use lingo you know she's she's so um, objective that it's scary <laughs> and and I love what she does. Hey, um, Chris V. Bernard says, I love, love, love the incorporation of music in your book. Was Luis Miguel always a part of hurricane season? Ah, uh, Luis Miguel was always a part of hurricane season, of course. Uh, Luis Miguel is part of, uh, of uh, the um, e e emotional education, sentimental education of, of, of Mexicans born in the 70s and the 80s i think uh it's kind of sad because normally those kind of that, that kind of pop music it's um it talks about toxic love it, it puts it puts like codependence and toxicity like like the ideal of romantic love and and it's really hard to get rid of that when you grow up you know because my mom used to hear those those songs and uh, rancheras and and lupita d'alessio and juan gabriel they they are really you know like heartfelt songs that, that talk about um, uh, cheating and, and, and missing and, and craving. And it's really, really, really hard. And for me, it was like the emotional landscape. It, it was part of the ambience and the atmosphere of the novel. And it, it is the thing that people uh, listen to all the time. And I personally, I'm a super fan of uh, Luis Miguel since I was three years old, or that's what my mom says. And I just couldn't just not put it there, you know? And there were other songs that don't appear there. For example, I, while writing the, the novel, in that uh, particular moment when you have to sit in front of the computer to start writing, that's the most difficult part of the writing process, I think. Bukowski used to say that uh, writing is not difficult at all, that it's super fun. That, that the, hard thing, the hard part is to sit in front of the machine, of the computer. And for doing that, I will always uh, put one song that's not in the novel because it doesn't, it really don't, don't have a place there. But it's uh, Goodbye Horses by Q. Lazarus. It's the song that, you know, the killer from uh, Silence of the Lambs listened while mm -hmm. he dances, you know, in front of the mirror. And it kind of, um, it, it, it is a preparation, um, a get ready uh, kind of song. And for me, it was a, also like a get ready kind of, uh, song that put me in certain mood to begin writing a book that really uh, um, demanded a lot of me uh, uh, emotionally. Fernanda gets ready to write the way a killer gets ready to, to, to do. <laughs> <laughs> we, we, can, we, we can resume, uh, we, we, we can say that about this conversation. Hey, I, I'm just gonna say really fast about three questions. I don't know, we're, I don't think we're gonna have time, but Jesus Constantino, uh, is talking about the relation bet between the big industry and rural communities and he says that your book it does a, a, a great job about uh, about talk, talking about this and he asks about if canonical writers in Mexico City have have something to say about the politics of resource extraction and we, I think it's a really important and really complex uh, uh, question. Mari Carmen Barrios Giordano says that she, uh, uh, Temporada de Huracanes, because she read it in Spanish, is one of 
her favorite books of all times, and she she disagrees that it's it's, it's uh, poverty porn, uh, uh, which of course I, I agree with what she's saying. And Leslie Hayard says, "Leería un poquito en español." We literally have four minutes. Do you wanna? Do you have it there? Do you wanna write like read like two paragraphs at least? Yes, to I do. In fact, I, I can uh, read a couple of paragraphs. You guys want, I can read like the first chapter. That's one page long. It's almost nothing. Let's go for it. Okay. And um, well, just quickly, uh, uh, the the uh, um, Jesus Constantino. I, I totally agree. Um, I think we have like difficulties uh, writing about these themes. Uh, I think it's because writers normally we don't take themes and develop a novel but it's, it, it kind of, for me, it's another whole process. So I'm not good at taking teams and, and so thinking like, uh, uh, yeah, I, I want to show how, what are the results of the necro capitalism in the Southeast of Mexico? I, I never think of that. I, I think in things that, that I've seen and people that I know, and I try to figure out how to insert the other ones. So I think it's a problem of method uh, and interest of the writers. Bueno, uno. Llegaron al canal por la brecha que sube del río, con las ondas prestas para la batalla y los ojos entornados, cosidos casi en el fulgor del mediodía. Eran cinco y su líder el único que llevaba traje de baño, una troza colorada que ardía entre las matas sedientas del cañaveral enano de principios de mayo. El resto de la tropa los seguía en calzoncillos, los cuatro calzados en botines de fango, los cuatro cargando por turnos el balde de piedras menudas que aquella misma mañana sacaron del río, los cuatro ceñudos y fieros, y tan dispuestos a inmolarse que ni siquiera el más pequeño de ellos se hubiera atrevido a confesar que sentía miedo, al avanzar con sigilo la saga de sus compañeros, la liga de la resortera tensa en sus manos, el guijarro apretado en la badana de cuero, listo para descalabrar lo primero que le saliera al paso, si la señal de la emboscada se hacía presente, en el chillido del vienteveo, reclutado como vigía, en los árboles a sus espaldas, o en el cascabeleo de las hojas al ser apartadas con violencia, o el zumbido de las piedras al partir el aire frente a sus caras, la brisa caliente, cargada de sopilotes etéreos, contra el cielo casi blanco, y de una peste que era peor que un puño de arena en la cara, un hedor que daban ganas de escupir para que no bajara las tripas, que quitaba las ganas de seguir avanzando. Pero el líder señaló el borde de la cañada, y los cinco agatas sobre la hierba seca, los cinco apiñados en un solo cuerpo, los cinco rodeados de moscas verdes, reconocieron al fin lo que asomaba sobre la espuma amarilla del agua, el rostro podrido de un muerto entre los juncos, y las bolsas de plástico que el viento empujaba desde la carretera, la máscara prieta que bullía en una miríada de culebras negras, y sonreía. Tan, tan. Muy bien. <laughs> Bellísimo. Gra gracias, uh, Fernanda. Oh, I, I forgot that we are speaking English. Uh, <laughs> um, well, I think uh, that's it. I just wanted to say uh, one thing. Someone was asking about this painting, which is, I suppose, is, <laughs> It's a local painter in New Orleans, and it's a painting based on a photograph of Francis Bacon, the painter and a critic, a famous critic. I don't know who the other guy is. So just, I just wanted to say that because I'm gonna ask about it. Fernanda, this was uh, great. I'm always amazed of your clarity. It's because it's, it's something we were talking about this right before getting started. I always get, get nervous. And I feel that I, uh, uh, I I never achieved the level of clarity that you that you have to really share your intelligence and and your process. So thank you very much for that. And I don't know, Jack wants to say something before we go. I just uh, uh, just wanted to thank you both again so much for this. This was fantastic. Um, it's a it's a great book that everyone should go out and buy. Please go buy this book. And by Yuri's while you're at it, if you don't have it already. Um, thank you again for uh, for um, appearing here, and thank all of you for watching. We uh, we really appreciate it. We put on these events, and we just put it out there on the internet. And please, dear God, somebody enjoy it. So uh, the fact we had so many questions tonight is very gratifying. Thank you so much. And uh, we have another uh, eight days of the festival. So liquidquake.org for all the details. Thanks again. Good night. Thank you guys. Bye.